Is that right? Yes. Great. Okay. Welcome everyone to the December 17th, 2020 Park and Recreation Commission for the City of San Rafael. Um, the first item, I think we can uh, call roll. All right, uh, Commissioner Emerson. Here. Commissioner Gutierrez. Here. Okay, great. Uh, Commissioner Lawman. Here. Commissioner Machado. Here. And Commissioner Reisinger. Here. Great. Thank you. Okay, next I'll invite Becky Orden to explain how the public can participate in this evening's agenda. All right, good evening, everyone. Viewers are welcome to provide public comment online through Zoom or telephone at 669-900-9128. And the meeting ID is 8785580921 and then pound. If you're watching this meeting through Zoom, please select the participant button and select raise hand if you wish to speak. If you are participating by telephone and wish to speak, please press star nine when it is your turn to speak and you will be notified by the host inviting you to participate. And you need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you're unmuted, you will have two minutes to provide your comments. Are there any amendments to this evening's agenda? There are none. Let's see none. Great, let's go on to the first item, which is to approve the regular meeting minutes of October 15th, 2020. Are there any questions from the commission to staff? Yes, uh, Commissioner Reisner here. I believe that the term limit for our term assignment for Jeff Jones was incorrect. I believe he served for more than one term. In the minutes. If staff could verify that and make that change if, if applicable. And are there any other comments from the commission to staff? Seeing none, okay. And then I'd like to open this item up for public comment. Are there any public comments on the minutes of October 15th, 2020? I don't see any comments. And so I guess we can close the public comment period. Okay, and so um, can I have someone uh, make a motion and a second to approve the minutes from move, October 15th? I move to approve the minutes. A second. Great. Becky, would you call roll call the vote? Yes, Commissioner Emerson? Yes. Commissioner Gutierrez? Yes. Commissioner Lawman? Yes. Commissioner Machado? Aye. And Commissioner Reisner? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion approved. All right. The second item on the agenda are introductions, awards, recognitions, and presentations. Susan, did you want to start this one off? Yes, thank you. I'd like to introduce Lindsay Lara. She is our city clerk. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. I'm happy to uh, swear in our newly appointed commissioners. So let's see, do we have someone? I don't have the agenda in front of me. Is there someone that you'd like me to have go first? Let's have Robert Sandoval go first. All right. Soon to be Commissioner Sandoval. If, I'll, if I could have you raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Robert Sandoval. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. 
In the Constitution of the State of California. In the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against foreign all enemies. And, foreign and domestic. <laughs> foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. In the Constitution of the State of California. In the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without me any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and now you are Commissioner Sandoval, which is exciting. Very exciting. Thanks, everyone. And Kayla, are you around? I think I'm I ready. You. Hi. Hi. All right. Go ahead and raise your right hand. Thank you. And repeat after me. I state your name. I, Kayla Cabrales. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Um, at this time, I, if the chair doesn't mind, I would like um, our two new commissioners to do a brief introduction of themselves so they can get to, you guys can get to know them. So Commissioner Sandoval, why don't you go first? Great, thanks, Susan. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Robert Sandoval, Commissioner Sandoval now, I guess. Uh, my wife and I, so my wife and I moved to San Rafael earlier this year, actually, but we've been living in the Bay Area since 2016. Um, I'm the son of two career uh, city level public servants down in the LA area. And um, the reason we actually moved up here from this from San Francisco was because my wife and I would always come up to Marin to enjoy the open space and the parks and we just loved it up here and we wanted uh, we decided we wanted to raise our family here. Uh, and given my background, I really was looking for opportunities to be involved at the local level. Um, and then at the same time, professionally, I'm also an attorney with Morrison and Forrester. But before that, I was um, working for the California Department of Justice. And one of my biggest clients was um, state parks. So that's kind of my, um, my uh, introduction to our parks in the state and my interest uh, at the local level as well. So thanks, everyone, for having me. Welcome. Welcome. Kayla, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Kayla Cabrales and I grew up in the Bay Area. I moved to Marin in 1994 and then to um, San Rafael in 1997. And um, my husband and I um, bought a house here and had our kids, now they're <laughs> teenagers. <laughs> there, I have my daughter, Amelia is 16. She goes to San Rafael High. My son, Gabriel is 13. He's an eighth grader at Davidson. And over there growing up, we have um, enjoyed all of the services of um, that the Parks and Recs has to offer the parks and for birthday parties and pool pass for the summer. And my husband and I got married at Falkirk. I'm, I think I mentioned that. And um, we um, have enjoyed so many different of classes. And I um, used to work at Industrial Light and Magic, which is one of the reasons why we moved to Santa Fe. 
Um, but um, in more recent years, I've been teaching at Coleman Elementary and I was working with the kids with computers and coding digital citizenship there and also taught an after school class through the city of San Rafael at Coleman, um, teaching those, those um, uh, fun, fun stuff on computers with kids. I really loved it. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, that that hasn't been happening lately. So I am teaching. Um, in addition to that, I always did teach at the Academy of Art in their visual effects department there, um, and um, I'm recently taking classes there too. <laughs> so um, I keep busy with uh, with everything going on, and um, I really wanted to be a part of this because I felt like I've sort of experienced it from all different angles and. Um, I've enjoyed all of that. So I wanted to give back. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. Before we start off with our next item, um, Chair Lawman, I just would like to briefly mention that Commissioner Machado will need to um, jump off the um, meeting call tonight at seven o'clock to uh, attend a work obligation. Thank you. Welcome to both of you. We're really happy to have you on this commission. Next item on the agenda is public comment from the audience regarding items that are not listed on the agenda. Is there anyone that would like to speak on items not on the agenda tonight? Becky, do we have anyone attending the meeting wishing to speak? We do have some attendees. I do not show any hands up. Um, if you are watching this meeting through Zoom, um, please select the participants button and select raise hand if you wish to speak. If you're participating by telephone and wish to speak, please press star nine. When it's your turn to speak, you will be notified the, um, and the host will invite you to participate and press star six to unmute yourself. Once you're unmuted, you will have two minutes to provide your comment. Okay, I don't see any hands, so we can continue. Okay, thank you, Becky. The next item on the agenda is a review of the updated guidelines for the canal and Terra Linda Community Gardens. So thank you. I'd like to introduce Catherine Kufa. She's the Assistant Library and Recreation Director for our department, and she will introduce four of our staff that are here tonight and we'll be giving you the presentation. Okay, yeah, I'm going to turn it straight over to, um, we've got Debbie Yonkin, our Senior Recreation Supervisor um, over at kind of the Terra Linda Community Center. Steve Mason, our Senior Recreation Supervisor at um, Boro Community Center. And then we've also got Tiffany Haley, Program Coordinator at the Terra Linda Community Center, and Habit Ahmad, our Program Coordinator at the Boro Community Center. So I think Debbie is going to start, start us off. Good evening, everyone. Um, Steve is going to handle the PowerPoint for us, so hopefully we can do this all virtually and work it out. Um, I just want to introduce you to both the Canal Community Garden and the Terra Linda Community Garden. Um, the staff have been working together over the last year or so trying to establish guidelines uh, that will meet the needs of both gardens. Um, what we have found is that we have gardeners who are in both gardeners, or excuse me, in both gardens, and uh, we're trying to find a way to be uh, more unified so uh, people understand kind of what their expectations are when they join a community garden for the city of San Rafael. Um, tonight, uh, well, just so you know, the Terra Linda Community Garden actually was is part of a JPA with the Miller Creek School District and was originally started back in 1975. So it is our oldest and uh, longest community garden um, in San Rafael. So that's kind of a, a neat thing to know. Um, as we go into similarities between the gardens, uh, both gardens are managed by the recreation staff with the department. Um, and we each have our own set of garden committees that has helped work with staff to establish, um, you know, volunteers for community garden work days um, and also provide guidance on when we do walkthroughs, if there are any issues with compliance. 
uh, they serve as a sounding board for gardeners uh, who either need to receive notification about compliance or gardeners who have general questions. Uh, both gardens are open to all of San Rafael residents. Um, there is an ongoing wait list of interested gardeners for both gardens. Um, as I mentioned, we do have community work days for gardeners and volunteers. Um, both gardens are intended to be organic gardens. We do ask that people use appropriate soils, that they're not using pesticides um, to make sure that we are producing an organic materials coming out of the garden. Um, we do have some communal fruit trees that are at both gardens, such as uh, Terra Linda has fig trees, and I believe Canal has um, different types of lemons and other produce. Uh, both gardens provide access to water and hoses on site for plot holders, and plots are reserved for a calendar year. Uh, basically, a gardener can review yearly uh, as long as they stay within compliance. Um, and uh, I think that's, as of that, I will turn it over to Hobbit, who will tell you a little bit more about the, Ter not Terra Linda, but uh, Canal Community Garden. Hello, everyone. Uh, the Canal Community Garden has some unique features, uh, such as 93 uh, plots within the garden are all raised beds made out of wood. Uh, and there are going to be three different types of plots that we have, uh, full size, which is about 50 square feet, uh, half size, which is about 25 square feet. Uh, and then we have 12 uh, ADA accessible raised beds uh, that are about three feet off the ground. Uh, and those are prioritized for individuals with disabilities. Uh, and then we also have a community shed use uh, that's available to all garden uh, gardeners with access to shared tools uh, and individual lockers available for free to all the gardeners. Uh, and then a greenhouse uh, access as well on site at the garden. All right, over to Tiffany. It's not gonna work. Okay, sorry about that. Can you guys hear me a little bit better? Yes. Um, so the Terra Linda Community Garden, we have 64 full plots, which are which is 450 square feet, and six half plots, which is 225 square feet. Um, we, the city, do, um, do not provide raised beds, um, but individual gardeners may build their own garden beds within their plot. And 25% of each individual gardener's plot may be used for storage since we do not have a storage shed at Terra Linda. And items will need to be stored a minimum of six inches off the ground within the individual's plot. Gardeners may have their own personal compost bins in their pot if they wish, um, but it does need to be within their pot borders. And then, um, just like Debbie mentioned, the land is owned by the Miller Creek School District, and we have a JTA with them um, to use the land. And I'll turn um, the PowerPoint back to Debbie to discuss policy changes. Okay, I apologize for the chaos, but apparently that does not like that Tiffany and I are too close in proximity to each other. Um, so basically, as I mentioned, we came together to kind of create universal policies that can apply to both gardens. Um, and has um, basically we're trying to unify both gardens so they have the same policies. There's not really a lot of differences um, in the way that we manage both gardens, but the main differences that we're, we're suggesting changing as far as policy is that uh, we are requesting one garden plot per household. 
City of San Rafael staff may grant temporary use or maintenance privileges to a garden member for more than one plot with the expectation that additional plots may be allocated to a new garden members at any time. Um, we do, as, as I think it's been mentioned, we have extensive wait lists for both gardens. The Terra Linda Community Garden has currently over 60 San Rafael residents who um, are waiting to get into the Terra Linda Garden. On average, it is taking roughly two to three years for someone to uh, come up off the wait list to receive a plot in the garden. Um, we have been asking anyone that goes on the wait list to be a San Rafael resident. And at the time of their registration or renewal, uh, we do ask to verify their residency. Um, effective 2021, we are saying that only San Rafael residents may be permitted to join the renew plots. Um, any current non-resident gardeners prior to the policy change will be allowed to continue membership until they leave the garden. Um, for instance, the Terra Linda Community Garden has eight plot holders who are not San Rafael residents. Um, but, um, you know, some of these gardeners, at least half of those eight have been in the garden since the uh, pretty much the start of the garden, the early years, um, late 70s, early 80s. So we don't want to see them move on since they've had such longevity in the garden, but we're trying to make sure that moving forward, that we are uh, trying to accommodate the needs within the city of San Rafael for San Rafael residents to have access to uh, the community garden. And the last one is additional policy changes. Um, we, this is where we're trying to streamline the process. Um, it's been a little complicated over the years because there hasn't been a clear policy on how to move someone along. Um, and because there is such a wait list and such a demand, we streamline the process to make sure that people understand uh, your notification if there is a compliance issue and at which point you will be moved on from the garden. So for instance, um, the first instance of non-compliance results in a notification of non-compliance and a request to bring plot into compliance within a certain time frame. And the second instance of non-compliance results in a similar notification, but with a notice that the plot must will be revoked if not brought into compliance. If brought into compliance, the plot holder will be notified that any further infractions will result in their plot being immediately revoked. The third instance of non-compliance results in the plot being revoked. Um, and as we mentioned before, we've had garden committees who have been working with us. Um, for instance, the Terra Linda Community Garden, um, over the course of years, we would go out to the gardeners to determine if there was anyone interested in applying to be part of the steering committee. And it was a voting process. But in the 12 years that I've been here, it has been really difficult to find new people interested in being on the steering committee um, who had the time to devote um, just to the committee itself. So we are proposing that we're changing the community garden committee to a community garden volunteer work group. We find that we have members within our garden who are interested in getting involved. And instead of an election process, this allows us to bring on as many volunteers um, that wanna work, work in the garden and provide a value to the garden. And we can utilize their skills and their interest in different ways to maximize uh, the benefit to the garden. So we are recommending that we're moving away from a committee and creating a volunteer work group that will serve the purpose of either working at the Canal Community Garden or the Terra Linda Community Garden. And any additional questions that you have? I got a question. Um, so do you have to be an experienced gardener to uh, to be to take part here? To, is there someone out there that can that can help uh, a novice? Yes. So we actually have quite a few gardeners who join the garden who like the idea of gardening, but they don't know where to get started. And that's been the nice part about some of the longevity in the garden is that we have people who step up and provide just tips or tricks or um, guidance on where to go to get more information. Um, so we've seen some, you know, new green thumbs really start to take off and uh, create wonderful plots of the garden. Um, and, you know, the big difference between like the Canal Community Garden and the Terra Linda Community Garden is that the Terra Linda Community Garden, the plot sizes are much larger. They require a lot more weeding, a lot more extensive 
um, care versus the canal garden is one of our newer gardeners or gardens. Um, and, you know, they have the raised plots, but they're a lot smaller in size. So definitely different structures for each, uh, but they are definitely servicing a need for the community. Um, and one other question is, and thank you very much. Um, in regards to uh, the compliance issues, um, how I, I know we've had some issues uh, out in the gardens in the past. Um, has, has this basically taken care of any uh, uh, bad actors out there? Yes. So this new process of how we're trying to streamline and notify uh, gardeners who are having issues uh, maintaining their plots is definitely help the process move forward where we're able to start turning over plots a little bit faster um, than what we have in the past. Great, thank you very much. I have a question. Given the wait list, is there a plan to expand the community gardens? Um, so, you know, the turnover is so small and it seems like it would be a great direction to go if the space could be acquired. Uh, possibly, um, you know, that is something to consider if there was more space available somewhere for community garden, but I'll leave that up to Susan and Catherine to pursue and to look into. I can tell you that, you know, there's not really a lot of opportunity for expansion at the two community gardens where they are now. Um, but that would be something to, you know, consider for the future. I know when we uh, put in the canal community garden, we were very fortunate to have Trust for Public Land help us out with that because it's a it's a big ticket to do something like that, but um, you know, it, it could be ideal along the lines. I actually have a question. Oh, sorry, I can't, the screen is oh, very yeah. small, I apologize. Sorry, maybe Steve, if we can do the, take off the, the screen share, then we can get, get the big faces. I was just gonna jump in and say, I think that the, the park and rec master planning time would be, would be a good, good time to have that discussion. Sounds good. And then, then my question was, you know, the community garden is obviously a community benefit and not a revenue generating program. We all acknowledge the benefits of outdoor space. I'm just curious to know that in terms of operating costs, how much it does actually quote unquote cost the department to you know, operate staff time, water utilities, management of the bad actors. Is, has a figure been put towards that? Yeah, we do have um, budgets kind of specifically when we divide down our program budgets for the gardens. Um, and I think that's, that is something we're going to address in the master fee update proposal that we'll be bringing forward, hopefully early next year. Um, I think at, at the moment, um, the, 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 two gardens have slightly different operating costs because the Terra Linda Community Garden is larger and is a bit older. There are different maintenance requirements than the Canal Community Garden. Um, so I think we do see a, neither of the gardens generate a ton of revenue, um, but I think that we do see that differential is, is a bit greater at the Terra Linda Community Garden. And when we bring forward the proposed fee update, um, that is kind of part of that consideration. I think one of the other things you might have noticed is like the, the Canal Community Garden, the plots are 50 square feet. We're at the Terra, Terra Linda Community Garden, they're 450, or 450 square feet. When I just I just want to clarify something that you said. You said the, uh, there's a little bit of revenue, um, but there's not. It's not net revenue, correct? Because I think the fees are what like seventy five dollars a year for the, and it's no, way more not, than okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, so just just curious in terms, you know, obviously now obviously COVID has hit really hard, and would love to expand the program. But if we're expanding any type of community garden, there is no an overall negative turnover in terms of money and how much we're putting it forward. And I just want to say, I loved the idea that um, Supervisor Yunkin um, put forth regarding volunteers to put time into the plots and manage things and kind of move around. I think that's a wonderful idea. I've di driven by both community gardens a few times and I've been like, hmm, you know, just looking at a few different things and sometimes they're beautiful and sometimes it's like, hmm. <laughs> so um, it's wonderful. But, and I just had um, one other, question was are there is there any um i know in city mill valley they did um and city of Pol i think it was pleasanton susan i could be wrong um but they put in a bunch of solar stuff to offset the cost of some 
different community garden elements. Do you guys have any plans to do that or is there even an infrastructure available to help offset that? I so think right now that hasn't been something that we've discussed, but yeah. So I think um, Catherine alluded to the park and recreation master plan that has been discussed uh, several times, I think by now. Um, and that will really give the process for the community to identify what they're currently using, um, you know, and also the demographics of what we are looking at in the next five to 15 years. And when you project out um, and you compare that with what the community is currently using and you look at trends, that will really indicate where, we, where our gaps are going to be and what we need to expand and what we need to contract. I think there is an overarching city um, direction that we're hoping to take, especially during COVID and with all the budgetary impacts that we've had, which is some of our, a lot of our programs generate revenue, but revenue is not profit. So with something like this, that is a probably, you know, it's a shared private benefit as well as a community benefit. Our hope with increasing fees would be that it would cover costs, but room for expansion will really come through the concept of expanding community gardens, whether that's an addition of another community garden or expanding the footprint of the two existing, would really come up through the master plan um, development as well as any kind of funding mechanisms that would make that possible. Because right now the city does not have the resources to um, expand or enhance. Um, you mentioned solar. I'm If Pleasanton has put that in, they've done it in the last two years since I've been gone. Thank you, and I just I just had one more quick question. Um, can when people sign up for both of the um, gardens, can they sign up as a family, or is it an individual? And the individual cannot like gift it to their kid, you know, because sometimes you see multiple people working on the plots. Just since that turnover takes a long time, I'm just wondering what the process is. So that's kind of one of the things that we're trying to streamline is that we're saying it's one plot per household. So. Um, you know, if you live with your parents, then your parents are able to assist you with your plots. Um, but if it's your parents' plot, you don't live together and your parents pass away, they can't will you the plots um, or you can't come in and take it over. So it does have to be the person has to be in the same household. I have a question. Are there um, any plots that um, are managed by groups instead of households, like like the school nearby or uh, any other community groups, or do they have any participation within the plots, even if they're not running one? So we do actually for Terra Linda, we have a developmental disabled adult program uh, that has a plot in the garden. Um, and we do have a couple of the local preschools who have expressed interest and they are on the wait list uh, when a plot comes open. And I believe the Canal Community Garden also has a group that's within their uh, garden as well, but I'll let Steve or Hobbit grab that one. Uh, at the Canal Garden, we have both uh, Linda Reed Activities Club uh, and I believe Marin Child Care Council, uh, who are current plot holders at the garden. Thank you. Are there any other comments from commissioners or questions for staff? I was just going to add to that comment. My question also was because this is a um, community asset on public land, it would be interesting in the parks master plan to evaluate ways in which education could be incorporated into the community gardens for public access. Okay. Are there any public comments on this item? Seeing none, any follow-up questions from commissioners to staff? Seeing none, I'll say thank you very much, everyone, for bringing this forward. Uh, the action is just to receive the report and provide any feedback on the community gardens. So thank you very much for this item. So, um, just, actually, uh, yeah, I would like Steve, if I'm hoping Steve was going to say something about the next steps in the process. Ah, thank you. Yes, tomorrow we're going to be sending these out to all the garden members at both gardens to get their input. And then we will be coming back to you, um, the commission in January for your final approval over it. Great. 
Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays. And thanks, staff, for taking your evening time to be with us as well. Happy holidays, you guys. Happy holidays to you all as well. Okay. So item five on our agenda tonight is selection of a new commission chair, vice chair, and committee assignments. Although I don't think we have any committees, so I think it's just the officers of the commission. Actually, we have all three tonight. So um, as, as the report indicates, we've had some changes on our commission and therefore our chair currently is vacant. Um, it is timely though, because this time of year is when we normally do the selection of the chair and vice chair and their appointment begins in January of the following calendar year. Um, we do have some appointments and those appointments, there's two. One of our board, uh, excuse me, one of our commission members was on the working group for the library and community center conceptual plan. And because they weren't reappointed to the commission, we will need to also reappoint one of the commissioners here um, to serve along with Ariel, so she's not lonely. Um, and then also the Pickleweed Advisory Committee. Both of, uh, we have one representative, which is Commissioner Reisner, and we have an alternate, which is Commissioner Gutierrez. Um, however, their terms can be reappointed. They are eligible to be reappointed a second time, um, but we would, when we get to that, we'll just need to confirm that they are interested in being reappointed. If not, then we would look for a nomination for the representative to the Pickleweed Advisory Committee, as well as an alternate. So to start it off, let's start off with chair. <laughs> we'll take one step at a time so it doesn't get so complicated. So what is beginning to happen? You guys have been um, kind of a step ahead, but the best practices out there are from Planning Commission and Design Review. And the City Council in this next few years are really um, governing and guiding the different boards and commissions to be in alignment, which means how they elect their chairs and vice chairs, how they run their meetings, what they what their agendas look like, the format and the reports. The good news is you're already doing it. Um, so the recommendation is that the chair and the vice chair will each serve a year term and that that hopefully will rotate from the commissioners that have the most seniority and then it will work its way down. So eventually the expectation will be anybody who comes on a board or commission will understand that the obligation is they will most likely need to serve as vice chair and chair of their board or commission, if that makes sense. But it gives them plenty of time to ramp up and feel comfortable in their role on that board or commission before they step into that higher level of responsibility. Having said that, you guys have been doing that all along. Um, most of your um, peers, who've had the most seniority have served as chair and vice chair. Um, and what you will soon find out is sometimes that vice chair will, you know, move up into the chair position and then logically the commission selects somebody to, for that vice chair and so forth. So that's the process that um, a few of the boards and commissions have been doing for a while and that's kind of where we're being guided. Um, that doesn't mean that that has to happen tonight. If somebody um, who's been on the commission or uh, for a while was not interested, that's fine. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give you the parameters and kind of the outline of what other boards and commissions are doing and what the direction is. So um, our commit, our chair was um, Chef Jones. And so going into this next year, we would like um, the group um, to let each other know if you're interested in serving in that position. Um, don't be shy um, because sometimes people get nominated without their uh, knowledge. So this would be the time if you're interested to let it be known. Um, and please understand that the chair and the vice chair have an a report, an important responsibility, but it is not daunting. It is to guide the meeting. It is to work with staff in making sure that the items are well represented and they're thought out and basically to be the point person and advocates for, for your respective commission. So it's not like you have to type the minutes, although you know we would love it, but uh, you, you get to work with us. So uh, Chair Lawman, if you would entertain um, and ask your fellow commissioners if they are interested in serving or ask who is interested in serving. Is anyone interested in serving as chair of the Frackenback Commission? 
Stacy, can you stay as chair or are you termed out? This year, 2021, I, I feel like I'm not able to commit to being chair. Okay, I'm happy to be something if no one else wants to do it. I will serve. That's what I'm saying right now. But Mark, if you want to serve. I, I would say that I would step up. Um, it's, it's my last year on the commission. And oh. so um, I would also step aside if there, there wants, there's want to be continuity. I would also say that I would, I'm looking at Ariel and I would nominate Ariel if she wanted to do it as well, because, you know, Ariel's a leader. Um, I've been part of uh, Rafael Racket Club for a long, long, long time, 30 some odd years. And um, she, as she's taken the helm, she's led that place to some great, you know, great places. So um, she's also a leader um, that can, that can step up. Thank you, Mark. I'd, I'd be happy. To. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else doesn't want to, I think everybody here would do a great job. I'm just chiming in to say that I do not have the extra time this year. So I support whoever would like to continue advocating for someone else. <laughs> well, the good news is we have a chair and a vice chair position that are both open. So um, there's, there's obviously two opportunities there. And it sounds like we have three people that are interested so far. Well, I'd like to nominate Mark because it's his last year and I think it's a good opportunity for him to step up. And he said he wanted to do it. So do I have a second? Second that. Chair, can you call for the second? Is there a second to nominate Mark Machado as the chair? I'll second. Is there, um, Chair, you would just ask if there's any discussion, and if not, then um, Becky can take the role. Is there any discussion about the chair position? Hearing none, Becky, would you take the role? All right, um, Commissioner Cabrales. Aye. Commissioner Emerson? Yes. Commissioner Gutierrez? Yes. Commissioner Machado? I will abstain. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't sure if I was to call you or not. Um, Commissioner Reisinger? Aye. And Commissioner Sandoval? Yes. And Commissioner Lawman? And Commissioner Lawman? Aye. All right. Motion has passed. Thank you, guys. I Congratulations, it. Mark. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay. So, Chair Lawman, if you could call for nominations for Vice Chair. Are there nominations for vice chair of the Park and Rec Commission for 2021? I'll nominate Commissioner Emerson. Are there any further nominations? If not, just uh, call for the second, please. Okay. Is there a second motion to? Support Commissioner Emerson. I will second. Excellent. Okay. All in favor to appoint Commissioner Emerson as the vice chair of the commission. Becky, you want to take the role again? All right. Commissioner Cabales? Yes. Commissioner Emerson? Yes. I'll vote for Emerson. <laughs> Yes. Commissioner Lauman? Yes. Commissioner Machado? Aye. Commissioner Reisinger? Aye. And Commissioner Sandoval? Yes. Thank you. Yay. Congratulations. Excellent. All right. Thank you guys. So the um, next position would be we need another individual to serve on the working group. I will remind everybody what this is for. This is a ad hoc committee. So that means it's aligned with a project that is just about ready to start. It's kind of the, the pre, it's kind of started a little bit already. It is um, in regards to the library and community center conceptual design at Albert Park. Just to remind everybody, the council directed staff over a year ago to get more information about doing a joint facility at the Albert Park site. 
they are also still exploring the Carnegie Library as the other site. So no determination has been made as to which is going to be the permanent location. But what the study is to do is to provide enough information so that the city council can do a comparative analysis and give staff direction as to which site they would like us to pursue. Um, the working group is comprised of two members of the city council, two members of the library foundation, two members of the Friends of the Library, two members from the Library Board of Trustees and two members from the Park and Recreation Commission. Commissioner Gutierrez is one of them. We are looking for her to have a partner in crime. Can I ask the time commitment please? And the duration Absolutely. and also the frequency. Well, the good news is Ariel's already done the heavy lift by reviewing 18 proposals, um, which was a, about a ream and a half of paper. And she also sat in, um, once we, we narrowed it down from 18 to five, five firms, she sat in all the virtual um, interviews with all five firms and we've narrowed it down to one. So the heavy lift has happened so far in, in regards to kind of research. Um, going forward, we are expecting about four to five meetings with the working group that will all be done virtually um, between now and June. They will conclude by June. Um, Four meetings is what really what we're looking at. And then the final presentation to the city council. So the working group will have this nice little meeting with the um, architectural firm that's currently in the process of being selected. And they will help to guide the process and what that, what the conceptual design looks like here. Hopefully that answers, um, just gives you, kind of frames it for you. I'm hoping somebody's going to step up because we re we really want to make sure it uh, is a library and joint community center, not just a library. So uh, we definitely need your input um, on that committee. It's really important. It should be really fun. It's a really um, the firm that's being talked to is has exciting ideas, and it's a um, I I just think it's really exciting. It was fun to be able to sit on in the interviews and see what what could be. Um, yeah, I believe it's four, maybe five, but I think it's four meetings. They're already planned out, basically one a month-ish. Um, I'm open to it. <laughs> I'm open to it. I heard two people, but I was I was checking one of my settings. So, um, Commissioner. So, Commissioner Cabrales is interested, and I am interested. But I'm happy to step aside if Commissioner Cabralis is interested and has the time to participate. Well, I will admit I'm a little bit nervous, but <laughs> I would <laughs> I'm interested in what it's about. So I I think, yeah, I, I you know. Go for it. Great. Are the meetings open to the public? The working group is not required under the Brown Act to be open to the public. Awesome. Can I call for? You can call for a nomination if you'd like. A nomination to the library and library and community center community center working group. Yeah, good enough. <laughs> I nominate uh, Commissioner Cabrales. I'll second. Okay, Becky, would you take the vote, please? I will. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Cabrales. And now, do I abstain or do I vote for myself? This is you can vote for yourself. Okay, yeah. I vote Our for person. myself. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Emerson. Yes. Commissioner Gutierrez. Yes. Commissioner Lauman. Yes. Commissioner Machado. Aye. Commissioner Reisinger. Aye. And Commissioner Sandoval. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Okay. And lastly, this is really to do a couple of things. This is to reaffirm that Commissioner Reisinger would like to be re reappointed to the Pickleweed Advisory Committee. She is eligible, but she first has to let us know if she's interested. And then also um, if she will I'll let her speak. Yes, thank you. Um, I would love to be reappointed. I feel like we 
didn't get to get as um, in depth as we had hoped with COVID. So I would love opportunity to rejoin that group if uh, you guys will have me. Fantastic. And then Commissioner Gutierrez is the alternate. And are you available to also serve um, a second term as the alternate? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay. Then uh, Chair Lawman, it's it's up to you to ask the rest of the commission if they'd like to reappoint or they would like to have different nominations. Is there anyone here that would like a different nomination for the Pickle View Advisory Group? Any open nomination? Seeing none, let's have a motion to nominate Commissioner Reisinger and Commissioner Gutierrez as an alternate to the Pickleweed Advisory Board. Any I motion? Move reappoint, I move to reappoint Commissioner Reisinger and Commissioner Gutierrez to the uh, Pickleweed Advisory Board. A second? A second. All right. Um, we'll take roll here. Commissioner Corrales? Yes. Commissioner Emerson? Yes. Commissioner Gutierrez? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Rauman? Yes. Commissioner Machado? Aye. Uh, uh, Commissioner Reisinger? Aye. And Commissioner Sandoval? Yes. Great, thank you. Well, you guys are great. Yay. Thank you very much. Okay. Have we completed that item, Susan? Yes, we item have. Five? Okay, great. Then let's move on to item six, review of the commission's schedule for 2021. And you will notice on your staff report, I left a typo. You would think I'd be so pleased to get rid of, uh... oh, Mark has to leave. I gotta go. Thank you guys, see ya. Thank you. You would think I'd be so happy to get rid of 2020, I would never write it again. But uh, <laughs> this, this is the commission's meeting schedule for 2021. And normally we review this, just, just for everybody's sake, we normally review this and it has been customary that this commission has chosen to go dark in August and December, usually on an annual basis, so they can have vacations, holidays, things like that. Um, considering this past year has been an unusual year, we were dark actually several months because of COVID. And then we had several months where we didn't have agenda items because of COVID. Um, so I've already checked um, our schedule in regards to if there was any conflicts with holidays, any major holidays or any, you know, break periods or anything like that. There doesn't appear to be, but that doesn't mean that you don't know of one that I'm missing. So I will give you an example. Um, it has happened where we have a commission or board with young families. And uh, one of the meetings was right during spring break, or it was um, the meeting hit the night of either middle school promotion or high school graduation, and we were not going to have a quorum. So if you could just quickly um, just review the calendar and the schedule and make sure that that looks good to you and there's nothing that's standing out to you in a normal year. Is the um, calendar on a different agenda? I don't see it on mine, but maybe it was, was it the amended one? No, so it is on, it is in the report that was attached. So it, it has its separate item, it's item number six. Oh, 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 oh got it. It's the second page. That yeah. has all the dates. Thank you. You're welcome. If everything looks fine, then what we would want you to do is just to, um, then we just leave it as is. You don't need to take any action on it because we're not making any amendments to it. Um, what we will do as we're going through the year, if there is a conflict, or if there's not going to be an agenda item, staff will contact the chair and vice chair to let them know in advance that there doesn't seem to be an item. Um, the commission normally does not meet just to talk. You, you need to meet um, when there's an agenda item. So sometimes you will have break periods that are unavoidable. So you might get a, a couple of months off um, just any in, in any circumstance. I'm just looking and it does appear that the February meeting is during winter break for San Rafael City Schools. For those of you who have kids. I'm gonna be tra traveling a lot during winter break. I'm flying all over. I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. Yeah, I know. That's, for a while. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> Sorry. We'll be in the purple. We won't go anywhere. 
we're could still here. Me, yeah. Could you but, tell me what the Zoom policy is for these coming meetings? Like if you are away, hopefully someday we can go away again. Do you normally or will you incorporate Zoom meetings into the regular meeting or it, will it be sort of all in person? Just wondering for future hopefulness. I, I swear you read my notes yesterday. I actually had a meeting with the city manager to ask um, the question. Um, COVID has brought some interesting things to light as well. And one of them is uh, life after Zoom. So normally um, if commissioners or board members or even city council members couldn't make their meeting, you know, then you run the risk of not having quorum or rescheduling the meeting. But now with the ability to attend virtually, um, will that be something that's considered and allowed? And so we're going, I'm going to be reaching out to the city clerk and find out if that is something that will be allowed because we have many of our commissioners do travel for work um, and could participate virtually. They just can't be physically here at the same time they're somewhere else. Well, so, I moved to have the February meeting be the third week of February just to not coincide with the, or is it the third or is it the, it is the fourth week just to not coincide with the San Rafael City School winter break for those of us who are dreaming of traveling and not wanting to zoom while we're traveling sorry just putting a good dream to have hope it's good to have hope <laughs> but we can do it now if that if that's okay with folks to just move it to the week of the 22nd we would need to take a look if that if that date would be available to us um i'm pretty sure we could do something like that the other thing we could do is wait to the january meeting and see if everyone's going to have a conflict with that week um Thank you for pointing that out. You're right, uh, the school district has a whole week off here. It's a, pu a pupil free, student free week, right? Um, so we can either make that, you guys can make the decision now or we can wait to January to find out if we're going to be hosting that meeting at that time. I think- My only concern is if we don't meet in January, like maybe it's better to just make the decision now just given our light agendas of the last year. So, sorry, I've got a barking dog, obviously. I think well, we, he feels the same way. To bring the garden policies back for approval in January and, and just given the timeline of the garden, we, we need to have those approved in January. So there will be a January meeting, even if that's the only thing on the agenda. And then I think the budget will be coming shortly thereafter. So it's up to you. It's what we can do if, if you would like to, you can make a, um, we can come back to you at the next meeting. What we can do is find out if that date is available to us where we can conduct it on that date. Is everybody available on the following Thursday? It is February 25th. Okay, so why don't we do this? Why don't you go ahead and mend the calendar um, to reflect that the date in February will be changed from the 18th to the 25th pending its availability and then staff will check and just confirm that it is and that way we don't have to come back to you and bring it back to you. Is that pending uh, conflict with other commissions or what would be the availability issue? Yeah, so we, we just need to make sure that we're not we're not hosting a meeting at the same time somebody else is needing our, our zoom platform to host another meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. But you can go ahead and make the motion now to amend the calendar with that exception. And uh, if, as long as we can confirm it, then we won't have to bring it back to you. Okay. Would someone uh, make a motion, please, to accept the calendar with amendments? I move to accept the calendar with amendments. Second, I'll second. Okay, is there public comment? We didn't take public comment. Is there any public comment? There is one attendee. Becky, is there somebody who wants to participate? Uh, I do not see any hands, um, but I will uh, remind once again, if you are watching this meeting through Zoom, please select the participants button and select raise hand if you wish to speak. If you are participating by telephone and wish to speak, please press star nine. When it's your turn to speak, you'll be notified by the host inviting you to participate and you need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you are unmuted, you will have two minutes to provide your comments. Okay, I don't see a raised hand here. I think we're okay to continue. Okay, seeing no comments, Becky, would you please um, call for a vote? All right, uh, Commissioner Cabrales. Yes. Commissioner Emerson. 
Yes. Commissioner Gutierrez? Yes. Commissioner Lauman? Yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Reisinger? Yes. Commissioner Sandoval? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay. And next item on the agenda is commission reports and comments. Are there any comments or commission reports that folks would like to share? Well, I just want to share that we gave our first doses of COVID vaccine today and yesterday. So wow. as some of you know, I've been working in the emergency operations center and public health for the last however many months. But even though our cases are 100 a day and we're the highest, in terms of our cases per day, we're actually the lowest in terms of all of the California counties in terms of our case rate. So it's bad, but it's not as bad as it could be. And the vaccine's here. So of course, going out to skilled nursing facilities, staff, and then, and you know, hospitals allocating to ER and ICU people, but it's take a breather, but it's gonna be a few more months before we're through it. But Yay. Thank you so much. Can you tell us what the uh, like emotional environment has been in the emergency operations center given the vaccines arrival? Um, you know, it's just been a, you know, it's a pandemic and we've all been working very hard and trying to like quadruple ourselves, which you can't do. So, you know, it's hard to keep up, but I think we're in a good place as far as our essential operations and sorry, the dog's barking, but um, you know, I think we're hopeful now that the vaccine's here. It's like we're seeing the end in sight. So that's really exciting. I do think that with the new government administration in place, we'll probably see more funding to get more vaccine and get it out to everyone. But it'll be a few months before we get there. So right now it's really going to be skilled nursing facility staff, residents, uh, you know, uh, healthcare folks, and then, you know, primary care, you know, outpatient operations, and then it'll, and then seniors and people at risk, and then it'll get to the general public later. So we're in it for the long haul, but the end is in sight, but still, you know, shelter in place is the new, the new thing because the cases are high. And so, yeah, don't travel. Otherwise you have to come back in quarantine. But the good news also I wanted to let you know is we have some new testing resources, which is that there's a new vendor called Curative, which is um, a, they have a great business model where it's done by insurance. And they're gonna be here five days a week in different locations, not in San Rafael, because we've got good testing resources in San Rafael, but there's gonna be one out at United Market on Tuesdays, uh, West Marin Mondays. And I think it's some com combination of Piper Park and Novato and there'll be some uh, press about that, but curative, they can test up to 500 people a day. And then there will in January be a drive through at the civic center. So that will be really expanding our testing operations. So that's gonna be super exciting for folks. So look, look, I will be communicating with my San Rafael counterparts to put that information out because that's happening pretty much in January, but yeah, the vaccine is here. So that's really exciting. Yay. Hey, thank you so much for everything you're doing on that. Uh, there, yeah, it's been a journey and it still is. It still is. It's okay. We're getting there. But, you know, great things. Schools are still open. The city of San Rafael has been a great partner and the schools have been a great partner. They're doing, uh, you know, really good work in the schools in terms of keeping schools open. So it's exciting. Taking um, what Commissioner Emerson just said about keeping schools open, um, I just want to give a shout out to the staff here for trying to keep programs going. I'm definitely that mom that has been calling, trying to get different programs to meet minimum enrollment and pushing things around to try and make it happen. Because, um, you know, it's just so hard to sign up right now. I mean, that's across the entire country. But every single time I've called the different phone numbers and talk to different people who don't know who I am, they've been amazing, professional, very helpful if something wasn't going to hit with enrollment. They suggested other options for my children to attend different activities and events. So I just wanted to say thank you. They are, every single time I call on the phone, they're very helpful in trying to get me what I need. Um, unfortunately, just the regular public aren't signing up, but that's is what it is. And there's nothing that we can really do about it. But I want to say thank you so much. The professional courtesy from the staff has been wonderful as a participant for the program.
Um, I'll, I'll quickly go back to the um, the working group real quick, just to um, what was really interesting to me. So yeah, we went through 18 proposals and it was, it was probably this much paper. Um, and uh, it, it was fascinating, We're all really good candidates. I mean, I don't know, I'd never done that before. They seemed all very qualified, certainly qualified architectural firms. Um, and the five that ended up um, being interviewed were all had experience doing a lot of library experience. And the, um, and yeah, the working group is a lot of library folks. And I don't know if I knew that going in. Um, and a lot of them have been doing this for a long time and they seem uh, sort of tired, um, very skeptical, not hopeful. <laughs> I know some of them from the community for you know decades back. Um, and so it's really interesting to work with that group because they're definitely, they have put in hours on, on this project and I'm um, new to it. So it's uh, great to get their viewpoint and, and hopefully hopefully we can be there to, to get the community center side of it um, met because there are a lot of the library side. There's six, seven, eight of them, there's a lot of them. Um, and so the, yeah, we there's a firm that was, sort of selected and they're being talked to um and i'm just hopeful i think it's a really cool process to go through I, i'm hopeful for san rafael um i think it's a really great site that and someone mentioned it during the, the process that it's so close to davidson and i hadn't honestly thought about it that way before which means that it's not laid out as well as it could be um i went to davidson <laughs> i go there all the time and i'd never really thought of it being right there um, so I'm really hopeful that it can be a real community hub, um, but who knows, you know, I know there's a million steps in between now and then, and it could end up at Carnegie and, and but um, I'm excited to be a part of the process. So um, I will report back after our, I guess, first meeting sometime in January or February. Thank you. Does anyone else have a report? Commissioner Reisinger, did you want to report out on um, the meeting with the Pickle Eat Advisory Committee? No, unfortunately, I was unable to attend that meeting. So um, Steve and I had been in communication back and forth, and unfortunately, I did miss that one. And just for the group, I apologize to keep turning my video off. I'm alone with my kids during bedtime and trying to dinner tonight. That wasn't the original plan, but it happened. And flexibility is everyone's new middle name during 2020. So I apologize that I keep turning it off. But um, that's just what happened this evening. So um, yes, thank you. <laughs> so we can move on to item eight, staff comments. There are upcoming meetings or events or things of interest that we should hear about. You're muted, Susan. Susan, we can't hear you. I got gotcha. you. You can hear me now, right? Yeah, okay. So um, the first thing is I just wanna remind everybody um, to have a wonderful, healthy and happy holiday, whatever that holiday is that you're celebrating. I know our family is celebrating the last night of Hanukkah tonight, and here I am. Um, and we're also celebrating Christmas next week. So I wish you all the best. Um, and I just hope everybody is here on this call next January and healthy. And, you know, that's what we all hope for. Um, in light of that, I just wanted to remind everybody that the libraries and the community centers will be on a furlough um, next week and the following week. So between the furlough schedule and the holidays, that means the libraries and the community centers will be closed starting this Sunday. We close on Saturday, but the libraries actually operate on Saturday. So from Sunday through January 3rd, the libraries and community centers will be closed. Um, I'm, I'm gonna give you the PSA for the library. If you happen to have a book at this time, they're not gonna fine you if it's due during that time, you're good, okay. Um, but we will, we will see you on January 4th. We will be back. Um, our voicemail messages say that, our emails say that. Uh, the website says that, but I just want to make sure that you knew that. If you want to reach out to me, if there's an email or a question, you guys know I'm addicted to my emails and my texts. So if you ever need anything, just reach out to me. I will answer it. Um, Catherine probably has some more fun things to share with you about what's going on maybe in the community or in regards to our centers or anything else. 
Um, I don't really have a whole lot else to report. I think with the, the shelter in place, um, we had to, to shift again. Um, so we are closed to all indoor programming at the moment. Um, I believe we do have a, some things going on. We were able to move. Uh, luckily, it kind of coincided both with this furlough schedule and just the end of our normal um, class cycle. So we were able to move a few of our classes that were ending outside for the last few sessions. Um, and I believe we may have a, a few um, faith-based rentals that are also taking place outside. Um, but for, for the moment, um, we have, we're, we're quiet and, and all indoor activity has kind of shut down and, and either moved outside or we're in the break between, between periods, um, between sessions. So I think that's, that's about it for, for the community centers right now. The, the child care facilities are continuing to run as they always have. I think we are, we are, um, reducing the number of programs we have for the two weeks over the holidays because there's just less demand and to give our staff time to take vacation um, as the the child care the child care staff are not subject to the furlough so um, they're they're continuing to to serve their community as they have been since the beginning since it's it's an essential service and um, needed so I think that's about that's about it the only thing I would add is, thank you, Catherine. The only thing I would add is um, the Marin County of Education, as you know, has been partnering with us all along since September to offer learning hubs at both the San Rafael Community Center and the Albert J. Boro Community Center. Um, we received a call and confirmed today that they will continue the program in January and possibly through February because of the, the recent shelter in place. So that program looks like it'll be continuing and the partnership will continue over at the Boro Community Center. They're also contacting the San Rafael City School District to find out if there is an overflow need um, from Davidson or San Rafael High School to have students at the San Rafael Community Center as an overflow site to them. And we're open to that and hopeful um, we're here for them. And we're here. So um, the building's just sitting here. So we'd love to have any type of use, especially to, that supports the community. So we'll know a little bit more about that when we come back in January. That's it. Thank you. I have one um, one thing back on item seven. Can I go back to item seven about um, reports or general questions actually? And that is um, in the past, I, I know that we've heard um, reports of how park maintenance staff have been deployed, particularly in the fall to do street maintenance and other work. And uh, I've, I've noticed recently that there are lots of staff out with leaf picking up vacuum machines, et cetera. And so I just wanted to shout out to those folks who are working really hard, who I think have been deployed away from their regular parks and facilities maintenance into taking care of streets and roads. So I just want to acknowledge those staff people. Thank you, we will pass that on. Okay. Any other staff report? That is it. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Happy Thanks, holidays. Stephanie. Happy holidays. Have a Thank good Happy holidays. Our meeting is adjourned at 720. Thank Day. you. Thank Have you. Nice. nice to see your new faces. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Good Thanks, night. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs>